Hello insiders, welcome to this new episode of the EU Bubble Insider. Today with a very special guest, James Stevens, managing partner of Ruth Pedersen Public Affairs here in Brussels. James, welcome to the show. Great to be here. You said in our previous conversation that you had this typical consulting career. I think it's an interesting statement considering uh, how successful uh, you have been so far. And I would uh, argue that there are many uh, consultants out there who would love to have such a typical career. Uh, so let me start with asking you, what is your secret? Uh, what has uh, led you to who you are and where you are yeah, today? Yeah, a secret. I'm not sure there's a secret, but um, if there is a secret, I'm probably about to share it. But um no, I don't. I don't think necessarily the secret. I I do think that um, consultancy is very much fit fits with who I am and what I enjoy doing. I love the variety of it. I love the autonomy that you get in consultancy to to build whatever it is you want to build and to explore new areas, whether that's new issues or new clients or industries. I mean, what a great opportunity it is to have a career where you can go up Heathrow Control Tower one day to learn how people land planes and then go and visit a chemical plant the next day or, you know, see all these different industries and, and try to understand how what they do fits with the discussions here in Brussels. Um, so I think, if anything, that inquisitive nature and, and wanting to learn about things and how they connect together is is what, one of the things that's the beauty of consultancy. And, and I suppose as long as you're having fun and you're learning more, then then any career is, is a place you want to want to be right and within all those industries you work for uh is there any you favor uh, the most yeah i mean i think um there's that whole thing right about um people saying you're a natural at or you're really good at and it's just about time and i think the more you learn about a subject matter or an industry the more i i certainly tend to get more interested and passionate about it i can get passionate and interested about most things if i'm honest but um, I think it would therefore have to be the chemical sector and everything to do with chemical regulation. When I started out um, in 2002 in consultancy at my last place, um, I just ended up by chance on the uh, in what was then the environment team, uh, working with the great late Sylvain Lote and, and a guy called Barry Lynham, who had a lot of passion for those issues. And, and I fell into that because I'd spent some time in the European Parliament on the Environment Committee working for a good member. Um, but I got very geeky for many years and still am a bit geeky about everything that's chemical related. Um, not that I knew anything about science. I mean, I, it, here's, you know, I, I dropped science at the age of 16, but suddenly found myself within a couple of weeks in consultancy, sat, sat on in all day meetings with toxicologists and ecotoxicologists learning about bizarre chemical tests that they'd done on rats and whether it was an adverse effect or, or not. Um, so I think if there was there is a place, it would probably be the chemical sector and chemical issues generally. Um, but but I can get passionate about most things, and I'm I'm just kind of interested in in the way that business interacts with the policy environment, and vice versa. And when working for such a specialized industry, how important is that you also become the expert in what the client does in the client's business? I think in consultancy, it is important to. Um, be able to talk the client's language and, you know, wh whether it's talking about extended one generational reprotox studies or whether it's talking about epidemiology or whatever it is, um, clearly you, you have to be able to at least understand it. And I think, you know, that's part of the role of the public affairs consultant certainly is to understand enough that if the client can get it across to you as, a, as an interested lay person, then there is a way of then translating that into more political messages to try and help the client explain that to the outside world who are perhaps less, a little bit less interested in the, the, the client's industry. So I think having enough knowledge is, is important and swimming in the stream of the industries in which you work. Um, but I think you always need to have some kind of detachment um, from that, you need to understand enough, but not become part of it, because that's why the client's paying you to be on the outside, to be that third party, to give that outside advice as well. So I think knowledge, which I think sometimes is overrated in the Brussels market, I think people obsess a bit about knowledge, but having enough knowledge then to deploy your expertise as a public affairs or communications counsellor is important. So I do believe, and, and the way we set up here is we have teams that are focused on specific issue areas or industries. 
because I, I think that there is a need to understand where the client's coming from if you're going to give good advice about what they then should do about it. So another thing that is often discussed now um, among both clients and consultants is um, how fast should we adapt to the changing landscape of digital media? Should we all be doing podcasts now? Uh, and should all heads of uh, organizations, all uh, general secretaries uh, record daily uh, videos on LinkedIn now? <clears throat> Yeah. How do so you? I think, yeah. 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 So I think um, I think it's something to consider, right? So I've been really lucky in my career. Um, you know, when I started out, as I mentioned in two thousand two, I was doing kind of existing substance regulation risk assessments on on chemicals that people wanted to ban. Um, but you know, comatology work. I've done legislative a lot of legislative work. Clearly, um, I've moved into more reputation. Uh, uh, soft sound, mu mood music kind of work as well over the times. I've even done kind of creative paid advertising campaigns in Brussels. So I've done the full panoply of things. And, and I think uh, from a practitioner's point of view, that variety of the, it's not only the variety of issues and industries that you work on that makes consultancy interesting. It's also the ability to look at what's go, what are the new communications channels and explore how you might use them with your clients in the context of public affairs. And I think what you've seen, and certainly I've seen over the last 20 years, is an increase in the use of different channels that we do use, right? And, and I think I go back probably to 2007, 2008, when my previous company was switching on around the world. And, and I remember going into the general manager's office and saying, hey, I want to start writing a blog. And she was like, what's a blog? And I said, well, it's this, and it's going to help us in this way. And that autonomy and entrepreneurialism led me to get into that kind of digital communication space back then and did the first Twitter account for an agency, wrote the first blog for an agency in town, started doing Google AdWords and Facebook ads and all sorts of things that I taught myself. And I think then you get onto some of the newer communication channels, as you say, and, and, and ways of disseminating content. I think it is something to explore, um, both from a kind of professional experience piece um, but also because we've moved past the point, I think, in Brussels where it's just about whatever your issue is, let's go meet five people in the parliament. I think there's a bigger recognition that um, policymakers, like everyone else, uh, take their information or are influenced by multiple different things, right? The, the MEP reads their local newspaper every morning, nine times out of ten, right? They probably, I've heard cabinet officials talk about the fact that they're on Twitter maybe not to engage externally, but as a, as a way of filtering news in their area by following important people in, in the area in which they work. Um, I think we have to look at the, the people, the policymaker side, and say, you know, they are also taking in information from all of these places. And, and you know, so to, to be effective, maybe not to swing a vote in the parliament tomorrow, but to certainly to build understanding the issue of what's going on in the world, Media relations, own media, really important. Um, you know, social media, paid media, all of those other channels should be part of our public affairs toolbox. I don't distinguish, if I'm honest, between some people in this town say, you know, that's public affairs. We talk about policy, we go meet people. This is communications, it's events, it's media in, in all its form, paid and shared. No, I make no distinction. I just call it all public affairs, right? So, public affairs, it's communications, which is focused on a specific audience of policymakers. And, and meeting someone is a, is a form of communication, speaking to them. And sometimes that's the best thing to do. But also maybe, you know, doing an op-ed in the FT, that, that also feels like it. And I think actually it's good that the commission and its transparency register do recognize that, right? You have to declare all activities which are directly or indirectly seeking to influence EU policymaking or implementation is, is the, the phrase in there. And I would subscribe to the commission's view. Um, everything we do here, whether it's media relations or or meeting people in Parliament and Commission is, is ha has the same goal. So I think some of those techniques are there. What I, I also, though, go back to is, while all of those channels are important, um, at the end of the day, our, our business is a people business, right? And it is about the ability to build relationships. Not, not the fact that you have relationships, but the ability to build them, I think, is important. And I don't think any of those other channels will ever replace the need for that face-to-face -face contact. I absolutely agree. Uh, but this uh, leads me to a question. If, in your opinion, this 
arrival of the, all those digital channels uh, in the communication mix uh, in public affairs has made it more easy to actually measure results, to to um, report and, and even to get some feedback for, for yourself if, if the campaign was successful or not. Yeah, I mean, I, I sometimes in a rather flippant way said, you know, public affairs is, is communications with a point in the fact that if you look, you know, historically, the, the kind of reason why clients come to a, a firm like ours um, is, you know, there's an amendment in the parliament that seeks to restrict my market. Please defeat that amendment. You know, and so, you know, historically, what would you do? You would go and meet a bunch of parliamentarians with your messages, position paper. You try and convince them to vote against said amendment. And there's a very clear outcome, which you can also put a, an ROI on, right? You can, you can measure it took us this amount of time and cost us this amount of money in terms of human capital. And the result was we, you know, defeated Amendment X, which, you know, saved our 30 million CapEx, right? It was a very clear but short thing. I think as public affairs has progressed, and I think the smart organizations realized that if, if you want to shape the external environment, you have to start very early in the process. And that's going to take a multiple of different channels. Um, and as we said, some of those digital channels, but let's go traditional and media as well, might be a, another good channel, events, third party coalition building, all of those kind of things, much longer lead times, probably a little bit harder to, to connect those things to the, the final outcome, because maybe that amendment that we just talked about was never tabled because we'd spent three years aligning the policy environment and policymakers thinking with, with where our organization is going to go, right? Um, so, so that becomes a, in one way, all of those digital tools make it easier to count engagement, awareness raising, changes in opinion over time. You, you know, there's lots of ways in which those tools allow you to do that. But in another way, it makes it slightly more difficult because that short term hit of, oh, my God, you know, they've tabled this in Parliament. That's going to destroy our business. We must stop that. Or we've tabled this in Parliament. It's going to enable our business and grow our market um, is a lot shorter term and easier to link back to the business piece of it. But I think business has changed, right? I mean, if you look at a lot of even that discussion about kind of stakeholder capitalism, um, I think most of the organizations that now come to this town come with a much more positive agenda about wanting to be part of the of the transition. In particular, if we're talking Green Deal, they want to be part of it, no matter which sector they play in. I think there's a lot more alignment about how business plays a role in moving society forward. And I think that alignment then allows, you know, perhaps a more enlightened view about the kind of activities that, that an organization might undertake. What is also a very specific thing about Brussels um, and often surprises people who work at comms, digital marketing uh, or anything around that uh, industry in, in, in other uh, areas uh, is the length of how the, the length of the campaigns. Uh, you mentioned you can have a campaign going on for three years um and how do you keep a strategy relevant for such a long time yeah um i think it's an interesting question i think i mean i think there's a there's a challenge with campaigns right people get very excited about launch they do right so lots of effort goes into launching campaign and, and big peak of activity at the beginning and then quite often there's a kind of we've launched with everyone goes like that right <laughs> No and actually, if you if you know anything about campaigns, it's it's about the drumbeat, right? It's it's about the fact that every day you're out there with the same message, and you keep going. And there's some great little aphorisms about things like you know you need to say it seven times in seven different ways. You know, uh, someone once said to me, um, the moment that the that you're getting bored of transmitting the message, that's the point at which the audience has heard it for the first time, right? So it is about shoe leather. I think that it is about shoe leather, and I do. I often say something like the um, only the uh, only the relentless lobbyist shall pass. Right? It's it's the guy or the campaign or the organisation that every day wakes up with that goal and just keeps pounding it and pounding it until, to be frank, some people might be a little bit annoyed, right? Because they've heard it so often, but they just keep going and keep going and keep going. And I think you see if you look around town, the people who are really successful are those ones that have got that the beast inside them and just keep going every day at the same thing and don't get distracted and have that goal and focus on it. And that takes a lot of discipline. And, and to be frank, not a lot of actors have that. 
James, we're in the EU year of skills. So because this is EU bubble podcast, we have to at least use one uh, commission hashtag. Uh, <laughs> so uh, let's talk about the EU uh, year of skills from the perspective of your uh, recruitment ref efforts in, in the last uh, years, because you, uh, the Ruth Patterson office in Brussels, grew quite impressively in in uh, in the time yeah. that included also COVID. Um, could you tell us a bit more about that? How 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 you achieved such a growth, and what uh, what kind of people, what kind of talents were you looking for uh, to have a team like you have today? Yeah, I mean you're right. I mean we we've been I want to say lucky, but it's perhaps not luck. It's a lot of hard work in in the fact that. Back in 2019, January in 2019, I think we were five people. There was myself, one partner, two interns, and a consultant. I think at last count, we're, we're now 79 of us in various different guises in the Brussels office. So we've, we've had really significant growth. Um, and, and I think the philosophy there, and you, you put about skills, is, the, is that you know, we don't make potato chips, right? The, the only thing that, that really we have as an organization is people. Um, and, and so we do put a huge amount of focus on both hiring the right people and retaining the right people. Um, and I think part of the, I, I think actually the, the, the number one reason why we've been so successful in growing is from the very outset, myself and, and some of the other partners said, actually, we've all worked in agency life a long time. We see that what we do and what, what, our, what our peers do in the marketplace It's pretty interchangeable. We all do pretty much the same stuff. The only real differentiator for us as an organization is going to be the culture that we have, like how we are. We want people to work here because of how we are, not what we do. We want people, clients to come to us, yes, because we're good at servicing them, and yes, because we give, give them good public affairs services of a high standard, but really the differentiation should be how we are as people, with them and with each other. So we put a huge, we put a, from the very outset, that was a real big focus of mine, continues to be. Um, we came up with behaviors that we live as a firm in, in this market, and we came up with values that sit on top of those of caring, inquisitive, and driven. And so that's the thing that I'm proudest about, to be honest. I don't need to be bigger than anyone else or better than anyone else. I just want to be better at being us and, and living those things. Um, and that bleeds into the recruitment, right? So. So when I look for people, to be honest, I'm, I'm having a conversation where I'm looking and, and asking them questions to try and establish how they're caring, inquisitive, and driven. Um, I do think that you know, knowledge can be attained. Like most of the people we come across have got postgraduate degrees, at least one, sometimes two, sometimes five, right? Uh, they've probably got some institutional experience, um, of some varieties, but if they come in at an entry level, it's normally a couple of internships, right? Um, and, and then we, we look through, but... Really, I'm looking for those three things, like culturally, are they going to fit within our organization? Uh, you know, are they going to care about each other? Are they going to care about our clients? Are they going to keep wanting to learn more every day about anything that gets them passionate? As I said, that's the great thing about consultancy, right? You can get passionate about something. If you can say to me, that's a, I'm going to get passionate about this and I want to work in this area, I'm going to say, that's great. It seems to align with us as a public affairs firm. Like, what do you need from me in order to make that happen? And then that drive to get up every day and do it over and over again, right? And, and just keep going. So we look for those three things in our interview process. We use it also in our self-assessments every quarter. We, we assess ourselves against our behaviors and against our values as part of our assessments. And we have lots and lots of conversation about those values and how we live them every day. And I think that's the, for me, that's the most important thing that I look for in people because there are lots of smart people out there. This town is full of them. We, we get CVs every day. But I want people that are going to reinforce how we are as people as much as deliver great services to our clients. So I would assume you don't have a list of values put somewhere on the wall. Uh, I actually, just, just... actually, we do. We do. We have it in, uh, as you come into our office, you have caring, inquisitive, and driven on the wall. You have about 20 behaviors that the team develops. So, I mean, they, they do mirror me, I hope, and I try to live them. Sometimes I fail, but I, quite often I fail. But... At least they're there as a reminder, and we use visual cues. So we use the man behind me actually as a visual cue around the office to remind people of those behaviors and those values. Um, but yes, we do, but it was an organic process, right? So we started off over the first year or two 
talking about the behaviors of, of how we are. So we start on behaviors and we codify them after a certain period. And then about a year later, we said, okay, if that's our behaviors, like what are the things that underpin all of those behaviors? And the, the caring, inquisitive and driven words came from the team sitting down and discussing it. I didn't, that wasn't, it wasn't my choice of words. It was their choice of words about how they felt we were as a group of people. Um, so it's a very organic process within the team to do that. Now there's a bigger challenge there now, right? Culture very easy when you're 20, 30 people, right? When I've got direct interaction with them all. Much more difficult when we're 80. So we're now in the process of trying to pay it forward to make sure that people that come into the organization are onboarded in how we are, even before they join. I do a weekly email to all of the team. Um, and, and my aim is actually to onboard people by starting to send that email to them before they join the organization. So they already get a sense of how we are as people. Because my email is always about reinforcing values and behaviors. And what's your approach to remote and hybrid work? I'm asking that question because my take on, on remote work is that it works great uh, as an addition. But uh, if it's the, the only setup you have in your company, then building a culture, building trust among people is very difficult uh, if you only see each other on, on computer screens. What's your, what's your, uh, take yeah, on that? Listen, I, you know, we, we grew rapidly during COVID, right. And, and many of our people for a number for quite a while and never actually really spent time together in the office. Um, and I could remark that it worked, right? Like we were all online. We were all working. Our clients were online. Like, you know, we had calls with the institutions online. Like we still functioned as a business. We grew throughout it. Right. But, It was not fun and it was suboptimal from a team perspective. You, I mean, I think if you are doing that kind of remote work, you have to, you have to put far much more structure into building the team around the meetings. Like you have to schedule that. You have to, you have to make it, it's like a, you have to put a real emphasis on that. I think the beauty of what we do is it is a people business, right? And I think it's that five, 10 minutes between meetings. It's the five minutes over coffee. It's the random hearing something in the corridor and having a chat about it. Um, that all of that social interaction in the work environment around the work is the bit that builds trust and understanding between people. And yes, you can do that in an offline environment, but you have to focus really hard on doing that for me. Right. And I also think, you know, public affairs as a, as a profession is, is a people business, right. And it is about relationships and, And I think particularly for those people coming into the organization or into any organization at a junior level, actually, there was a, a good article in the New York Times the other week about this, said um, that they'd done some of the first studies that had looked at the effects of uh, remote working. And it had suggested that it's okay for people like me. I have a network. I have relationships, all of those kind of things, right? It's probably okay for my mid-levels as well. But the real people that struggle are the, are the entry or junior level people who are growing because they honestly, they just need coaching and, and they admit you lose that coaching element quite quickly if your mid and senior level people are not in the building and not able to have that passing conversation where you're not able to, you know, pop your head around the door and say, hey, James, I'm doing this. What do you think? Could you just give me a minute on what you think about this? So that informal coaching bit is missing for a lot of the junior staff. So, so you know, I love being in the office. I'm here five days a week unless I'm traveling. I like the social action. I like the fact that the team see me and I see them and I can just say, hey, how is it going? And just ask that open question to someone in the corridor. And it's amazing what you get from that that you'll never get in an email exchange or a WhatsApp or a Teams message, right? The opportunity to look at someone's face and go, they don't look happy. I'm just like, hey, what's going on? And you'll find out so much more. Um, so I w I'm here five days a week. The, the vast majority of our team are here pretty much all the time, if I'm honest. Um, but the, the rule we have is the majority of your time should be spent in the office and I'm not going to dictate what a majority looks like for you. And the reason I did that was I felt if I said two and a half days or three days a week, there will be some people who wanted to come in five days a week, but would, would feel that because I'd said three days, they, they shouldn't come in five days a week. So you define what the majority is for you, but it has to be a majority, right? And the second thing we had is, and I'm okay, you working from home, right? And, and to be honest, that's always been the case throughout the 20 years I've worked in consult, 21 years I've worked in consultancy. You know, you've got a big report to write, you need some space and time, you take yourself at home for the day, you do it from there, right? You've got a meeting on one side of town and 
you don't come back to the office, you go and do a few hours work from home. That flexibility, I think, in consultancy has always been there. It's one of the beauties of consultancy. But what I've said is if you, if you do work from home, that's fine. The majority of your time in the office, but if you want to work from home on Friday, go for your life. The only question you have to ask yourself as an individual team member is, does me working from home, does that negatively impact anyone else in my team? And if it does, it's your responsibility to decide whether it's a good idea that you work from home on Friday. I'm not going to dictate that. You're a team member. You have responsibilities as well as rights. And that's your responsibility to help this team function. So over to you if you think Friday you can work from home. You said that uh, one of the most beautiful things about working and consulting is that you learn uh, new things all the time. Uh, yeah. And I was going to ask you uh, about the skills that someone who should who would like to work for you should should be learning uh, right now. But actually, I'm going to turn this question around and ask you, what are you learning right now? What is your uh, most exciting uh, learning experience uh, these days, 2023? Listen, I, I'm really lucky in the last five years, I've, I've learned a huge amount. I, I was a leader at my last place, right? I was on the leading board and I ran large teams, but it's very different being part of a three-person board and then being the managing partner is a kind of different different thing. I've learned a huge amount about going from a startup, which we were in 2019, to, to the size we are today um, and what that takes. And that's been like the most enriching professional experience. Um, I, I still get a buzz working with clients. I still get a buzz of doing the traditional public affairs stuff. I still write position papers and look at amendments and I still do all of that as well, right? But that running and growing a team of people it has been an amazing experience, and that's been great. I guess now I'm at that. I'm at that. The, the bit that excites me at the moment is is now seeing the amount of senior leaders we now have within our organisation in Brussels, and seeing them take on more and more responsibility. So it isn't the James Show anymore. It's the leadership, the the, the management of the office, and, and, and many others who are increasingly taking ownership of, uh, of things and I'm less and less involved in, in day-to-day decision-making, which is great, and seeing them go and give them an opportunity to do that. If I was to mark out something that, that is also really fascinating for me, um, we've had a great growth story in Ruth Pedersen in Brussels, but we've also been part of a broader Ruth Pedersen story. So when I started here, it was the four Nordic offices where we're, we're a pretty dominant player, to be honest. We're like a big player in those four markets plus a little satellite office in Brussels that was just starting. Now we're in Berlin, we're in Poland, we're in London, we're in Sofia, Bulgaria, we're across the three Baltics. Um, we're about to um, open up in Spain uh, and Italy later this year. Um, and being part of that journey of a company which everywhere does public affairs, and I think that's our, our differentiator is wherever Ruth Pedersen goes, we're a public affairs company. And, and many of our peers here in Brussels, they're amazingly good at public affairs in Brussels. But if you go to their other offices, then they don't know a lot of public affairs. We know essence of strategy, know what you do and what you don't do. And we don't do brand marketing. And we don't do a huge amount of corporate comms. We're a public affairs firm. Um, and to be part, working with Morton, Mr. Ruth Pedersen, um, to be part of driving that expansion into new geographies and bringing on board new teams in new places, whether it's by hiring individuals or by acquiring other firms, has been an amazing experience. Moulton is an amazing, amazing uh, guy in terms of the way he thinks and, and his ability to do deals. Uh, and sitting alongside him and seeing how he operates and his vision of the future has been a, a fantastic experience so far. And, and something I'd never done. I mean, I'm doing mergers and acquisitions. It's amazing. Never thought I'd do that. And how important in this in this growth is the ability to distinguish between good, great, and bad clients? Oof. Clearly there are no bad clients. Um, there are just, actually, you know, this goes back to just being us, right? So, as I said before, um, I, 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 look at, I look at us and say, look, we are who we are, right? And we are how we are. And, and some people are going to like that and some people are not going to like that. Right. And I'm okay with that. Right. I'm okay that sometimes we have clients and it just doesn't fit. And in, in recent months, we, we've walked away from two competitive opportunities at various stages where we've said to the client, this is just not going to work. Like we're just not your people. Right. We can do this job, but we know we're not going to enjoy this and you're probably not going to enjoy it either. Like here's some other people you could go work with. 
because it's just not a fit with us. So I'm okay with that. I think, uh, and, 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 and that's not to say they're bad clients, right? They're just different clients in the same way with different consultancy. Um, but I think if I was, I think a good client is one that likes how we are, not only what we do, but also, and it's a bit overused, wants to be a partner, right? So I think the good client recognizes to get the best out of your consultancy, you you have to invest as much as the consultancy does in the relationship. It's a relationship. And that's going to take time from you, as much time from you as it takes time from the consultancy. Um, they also recognize that value will change over time, right? So you can imagine quite often in a client relationship at the beginning, there's a lot of kind of strategic thinking -y kind of stuff, right? And client counsel, let's say. But actually, clients want to help you help them think. But at a certain point, they probably want you to do stuff as well, right? So you naturally fall into more of an implementation mode. And there's peaks of getting back into the advisory bit. Um, and as the client develops, maybe the campaign develops, maybe the client team develops, then the value that you provide is going to change over time. So I think the best clients know that it takes their investment as well, but they also recognize that the, the value that is provided over time will change and it will be different things that are valued within that relationship. But it's, it's like any relationship. It's like a relationship with another person in your personal life, right? right? You, you realize that it takes time and you realize that, that the nature of that relationship will change over time. But that's okay. That's how relationships are supposed to be. Like everything's a transition, right? Everything's about us transitioning to different places. And then sometimes <clears throat> with clients who, because it's a different thing working for an organization that has been in Brussels uh, for some time already or is Brussels-based, um, in comparison to clients who are just new to the to the town uh, arriving and might have a lot of misconceptions about how things are done uh, in the EU bubble, how do you how, how do you address that? How do you how do you welcome people to to the to the to the EU bubble uh, public affairs world? I think I think quite often the I think two things. I think first of all, I think when people come in, quite often they want to talk about them, right? So I think the first challenge is to help any organisation understand that it's not about you; it's about the people that you're trying to talk to and what their needs and interests are and how do we help them get to where they want to do get to and that will help you get to where you want to get to so i think that's part of it um i think the second thing is that the um i think quite often people from the outside if they do it right find actually that process is a great open place i mean to be honest this is how democracy should work lots of people with great ideas sharing them and a bunch of people who are elected then taking a final decision based on a whole bunch of criteria which include societal good who voted for them all of those kind of things but i i love the openness of process about the debate about ideas i do think it's an ideas town even when we disagree and i i i, I get upset when people start to criticize the process system actually because i think it works very very well from a democracy standpoint um the amount of actors with their different views and i think generally speaking the policy outcomes for europeans are pretty good actually you know we, we come up with some pretty decent legislation that's doing the right thing. As a European, I'm kind of happy to be part of this kind of project at European level. Actually, it's kind of my mission in life to help build the European project. So I'm, I'm kind of happy about playing, playing my role in that. Um, so I think, I think incoming organizations, as long as they take the right approach, kind of get surprised that people do want to listen to them and, and do want to take their views on board. Even if they are a relatively small organization, you're relatively small, but you've got something important to contribute, people will listen to you and, and they may take decisions at least in part based on what you're what you're saying and i think people then coming from the outside find that almost a surprise that that this brussels thing can can be so responsive to to what people are saying and also i think what people what surprises people uh, who are new to brussels is how because of how the system works and how much time it takes uh, for the commission to assess uh, specific things, how well the commission actually is informed, how well uh, people there understand the issues they deal with. Yeah, I mean, listen, I think, you know, a lot of the stuff we deal with is highly technical, right? I mean, everything to do with the internal marketing goods and you know, and, and even within units within the commission where they do focus on a sector, um, or a specific policy area that affects a specific sector, you can't 
you can't imagine that they're going to know everything about that sector and how it works. Many of them have never worked in the industry that they're regulating, which I think is a shame, if I'm honest, because I think it would be make better policy if they did have some experience of it. I think there were programs like in the, that in the past for commission pressure, where they ended them all. Um, but having said that, I, I would praise all. I would praise the commission actually. I think they do a super job, generally speaking. I think it's full of people who are trying to do the right thing. And that's what I would say to people coming in from the outside. Like nine times out of ten, if the commission did something that was bad towards you, it, it probably because they just didn't know you existed, or they didn't know your point of view. Or you know, I mean, the complexity of regulating markets is is huge. And the value chain interactions are, are, are so complex. I mean, you could take an example now, which they're finding out, right? This, this PFAS restriction at, at ECHA that's been proposed. I think the original people, the academics who wrote the paper, didn't realize when they wrote the paper that the complexity of, of PFAS. And now every day someone's coming out and saying, hang on a minute, I think I kind of need PFAS. I didn't realize I had it, but I do. And, and so, you know, what seemed like a very simple approach in that case from the member states that submitted this dossier to ECHA, just opens up all of these questions because of the complexity of supply chains, industry, all of those kind of things, which I, and it's, it's a big current example that I think if you look across policy generally, um, you know, there are no easy, easy things here, right? Life's full of complexity and shades of grey. Um, and, and I think, you know, but again, I would praise the commission services. I think they do a super job. I think they're all really smart, dedicated people on the whole. Okay, it's like an organization that is sort of not smart and not dedicated people, but on the whole, you would say as an organization, they try to do the right thing. Um, and so I, I would praise it and say that it's, a, it's, you know, over the years been very, very good. Equally, I would praise many of the parliamentarians, right? I mean, I was down in Strasbourg a couple of weeks ago talking about critical raw materials with, with various um, parliamentarians for the metals industry. Some exceptionally smart people, MEPs, really thinking through things, listening, balancing different opinions, as my former boss, my late boss did, right? He would have 10 lobbyists come and see him a day. But he was the former president of the Oxford Union. He was an Emmy-winning broadcaster. And I knew full well he listened to all of those opinions. And then he made up his own goddamn mind based on his political principles, based on his policy objectives for the people that he served. And I think there are a lot of people like that in this town. They're all trying to do the right thing by Europeans. They might have different political views. But honestly, give me this system compared to say, I don't know, shall we not talk about the US system or, or the UK system, right? Like, give me this system any day of the week. I think it delivers great policy outcomes on the whole. Or, uh, you know, I think it's thoughtful about what it does. I think people try to listen to all sides of you and then they make up their own mind based on you know the remit that they have. And I think that's how democracy should work. And I think, to be honest, Brussels, we need to champion that more. We need to say, actually, this is a great system. This gives good outcomes. And actually, it works because there are a lot of people like me and you, like our clients, like the NGOs, who are all trying to input into the system. And that's how it should work. And we should be very, very proud of that as Europeans. Talking about Brussels PR or Brussels bubble PR, which doesn't... Uh seem to be working well yet but uh with more and more people from the bubble uh, going online sharing their experience maybe even with this podcast we can shed some light on on uh the the the, the good side of of, of this complicated uh, process uh, that's yeah. happening here yeah i mean i think i'm always a little bit uh, reticent when the commission do try the new institutions do to, to to do public education campaigns I'm not sure public institutions doing that. When I was looking at the um, data from the Edelman Trust Barometer the other week, and I noticed that government seemed to be a lot less trusted than business. Um, I, you know, and I'm, I'm not always, I often wonder why the commission doesn't like team up with some of the consumer goods manufacturers who, who seem to be quite good at communicating to consumers and take a leaf out of some of their book about how they motivate people to, you know, in some cases change behavior, like consumer goods manufacturers get people to change behavior. Yeah. Um, and yet I see some of the environmental legislation that was adopted in recent years with warning labels. And I think, did no one read any psychology literature? Can someone in the commission read Cialdini and how to actually change behaviors? Because that legislation makes no Different sense. Playbook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so maybe, maybe the commission should team up with some of the FMCG companies to work out how to actually communicate to uh, citizens. Uh, James, last question uh, about the future. Uh, I know you're not a futurologist. Uh, I'm but, definitely not a futurologist. Um, I, I just want to ask how you're, how, how you're uh, preparing uh, for the future. Uh, we're 
I think we're past the hype about AI that, you know, it's going to take away our jobs. Uh, you know, it's uh, not going to happen in a way that uh, was anticipated when ChatGPT launched. But still, um, it's it's going to revolutionize a lot um, in, in, in industries that um, create uh, something creative that, that, that involve writing, thinking, um, much faster than the blue collar industries that were anticipated to, uh, to be um, gone faster because of AI taking over uh, drivers' jobs uh, or anything like that. So, uh, what's your take on that? How are you how are you assessing uh, the current state of um, this technological revolution? And from the point of view of the industry, of course. Yeah, I mean, I think. So I, for one, I'm a little bit of a player on online things. So I'm myself experimenting with all of these different AI tools just to see what they can do, right? Um, I, think it fasc- I find it fascinating. Um, but I think uh, what we do have here is a group of people who are looking at this from a kind of, um, what's the word, uh, from a kind of like uh, service chain, you know, looking at each element of what we do and saying, where could there be a role for AI in making us in some way more efficient, right? So I, I think, you know, my, my clear view is I don't think AI replaces public affairs people, right? And you only need to look at the US. There was the, there was the case of the lawyer in the US who decided rather ill advisedly yeah. to use AI to, to write his brief and his arguments, and it came up with citations of court cases that didn't exist. And he's currently That's called of AI hallucinations. That's called yes. hallucinations. So, yeah, yeah, being a lawyer and using that in a court of law is probably not a great idea. But I think we can look at each element of what we do as a firm and, and what we do as public affairs practitioners and say, where can some of these tools help us become more efficient at what we do? Okay. And, and maybe that what that does for a firm like ours is that it then enables our people to do what I want us to do, which is be good consultants to consult. So I think that's a, you know, a strong point of view from me is yes, the doing is important and, and we have a challenge in the way that in many of our client relationships are in some way based on hourly rates, right? And so if you do things quickly, you might not pay as much. So, yeah. But but there's a different thing when you, you move into the, the kind of real value of the consultant. Yes, it's arms and legs, but it's also that consultative advice. And so, again, we spend a lot of time here talking to people about how we don't want to be knowledge holders. Necessarily. You know, we do want knowledge, as I said before, but actually the core skills we're looking for is consulting skills, as within any any professional services firm, right? It's, a con- it's being expert in what you know, but then it's the consulting bit that makes you great. Huh? And I think that's a challenge for many people in the market. They kind of obsess about the knowledge base. I know a lot about energy policy. Let me tell you about the directive. And they forget that actually our job is to consult and then help people affect change, right? Yeah. And, and so, we're we're, we're so, consultants, not research officers. Exactly. And so I think that, so I think that the AI bit is we have a team looking at it and kind of breaking down our, our kind of service chain and looking at where could you plug in some of those things to make us more efficient? How could that help us and our clients? We're at the very beginnings of that. And, and maybe if I've read my professional services firm literature, it suggests that you want to be the second adopter, not the first adopter of anything. Um, so we're taking a little bit of time about it and doing it thought- thoughtfully. And at the same time, some of us are having fun just playing online and checking out these tools and, and thinking. And I think that's, Something I've always enjoyed in my career, um, did it at the last place, done it here, is you know, is taking things from one domain and turning them around and plugging them into our domain and seeing how that works and how that moves us forward. And I think AI could be part of that, but I think there's a long way, to, long way to go. And I do fundamentally believe that it's still a people business and it's still a consulting business. And I don't think that any tool like AI or whether it's some of these um, kind of stakeholder relations CRM tools that have, have come onto the market in the last five years, or whether it's the likes of your Politico pros, right? Or any of these things that have come on and people said, oh, that's going to change the way we lobby and all of this kind of thing. And I'm saying, well, it might make it more a little bit more efficient, a little bit more effective, but I don't think, I think we're fundamentally still a people business, right? And so I think once you take, take that as its core, I'm not sure that this profession is one way you can automatize out, automatize everything and get rid of us. So I'm I'm pretty cool about that. I love to conclude with that because there's uh, I think nothing better that can be said about uh, the the beauty of this industry um, and 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 this job. 
uh james thank you uh for your time today for for sharing so uh much uh, interesting insights uh, i really enjoyed talking with you so thank you yeah, very much for joining thanks so much and to anyone listening uh thank you for being with us and uh tune in for the next episode uh that's going to be out soon probably next week thank you Take have care. a great day bye bye